Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the Pearson Ed Excel International A Level Biology Revision. This is Topic 2, Membrane, Proteins, DNA and Gene Expression. So in this video, we're going to be looking at Topic 2A. Topic 2A1 begins with cell membranes. So here we're going to be looking at the functions as well as the components of the cell membrane. When we talk about cell membranes, these include the membrane surrounding organelles as well as the cell surface membrane. The cell surface membrane is the most obvious cell membrane because it forms a boundary around the whole cell. All membranes act as barriers and this is to control whatever passes through or enters through them. This includes fluids as well as nutrients that are required in specific organelles or within the cell as a whole. The purpose is to ensure that there are suitable conditions on either side in order for specific reactions to occur either within the organelles or within the cytoplasm of a specific cell. Membranes within cells also provide sites for specific chemical reactions, like the internal membrane of the mitochondria and their involvement in respiration. In uh, your second year, you talk about the electron transport chain as well as the components, and here you will see how ATP synthesis occurs with the help of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Membranes must be flexible to allow them to change shape. This change in shape can be slightly as water content changes within the cell, or it can be very drastic, like when the white blood cells engulf pathogens during immune response. So here we're looking at the overall structure of the cell membrane. We know that membranes are composed of two molecules or types of molecules. We have the phospholipids as well as the proteins. These are arranged in a specific way in order to create the desired function as well as structure of the cell membrane. The phospholipid, which is an example, we can see this one here contains two fatty acid tails. This is one fatty acid tail, and that is the next. One glycerol, which is what we see here, as well as a phosphate group. The phosphate group and the glycerol kind of create what we call the head. This head is going to be polar, or it's going to be hydrophilic, while the tails are going to be hydrophobic. So I included that in here. Fatty acid tails are hydrophobic, while the heads are hydrophilic due to the charge on the phosphate. You need to know that phospholipids can form monolayer, like we see here. If the phospholipids are inclined towards an aqueous layer, like we see here, here we have water, and on the other side we have air, we're going to have a structure which forms a monolayer. However, if the phospholipids are within water, then we're going to have a structure similar to a micelle you see here. This is a micelle. All the tails that are hydrophobic are aligned or inclined towards each other, where the heads that are hydrophilic are inclined towards the aqueous layer. In this case, this is water. Moving on to the phospholipid bilayer. The bilayer is made of course of phospholipids on either side. This is an aqueous layer and this is an aqueous layer. And we can see the heads that are hydrophilic are inclined towards the aqueous layer on either side, while the phospholipid tails that are hydrophobic are inclined towards each other. So here I say the phospholipids form a bilayer and the hydrophilic, which are the polar heads, point towards the aqueous layer, while the hydrophobic, which are non-polar tails, face away from the aqueous layer. In this bilayer, the tails face each other, protected away from the aqueous layer. All membranes are made from this unit structure, which is like in form of a bilayer. When we go to the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane, this model was first proposed by S. Jonathan Singer and Garth Nicholson in 1972, and is the best known model for the structure of the cell membrane today. According to the fluid mosaic model, the phospholipid bilayer is a fluid system, the idea that it can move or its fluidity in nature is where this name comes from. So this fluid system contains many proteins and other molecules like cholesterol. In this bilayer, cholesterol is more rigid than many phospholipids. So cholesterol provides rigidity to the bilayer so that it does not move away from each other so much in order to prevent uncontrolled movement of substances in and out of the cell. In this fluid system, the proteins move freely the extent of movement depends on the proportion of unsaturated fatty acids. Like I said already, rigidity of cholesterol makes the membrane more stable and stronger, and this makes the membrane a more effective barrier to the movement of ions and molecules. This prevents uncontrolled movement of substances in and out of the cell, like I said already, as well as in and out of specific organelles. The advantage of this is that conditions can be controlled effectively in order for enzyme-controlled reactions to be carried out appropriately. In assembling the proteins within the phospholipid bilayer, the hydrophobic parts of the proteins are going to interact with the fatty acid hydrophobic tails. 
and the hydrophilic part of the proteins are going to make pores or channels within the membrane so that substances can go through them. The pores or channels can be either permanent or they could be temporally, and these are involved in activities like moving substances across the cell membrane. These substances could be ions, they could be glucose, they could be anything that is required in or that is required to be taken out of the cell. So in talking about these channel proteins, some of them are gated proteins, meaning they can open and shut, depending on the conditions in the cell, why some protein pores are active carriers that use ATP to transport substances across the cell. There are some proteins that may act as specific receptor molecules, some may act as enzymes, and some may act as recognition molecules like glycoproteins. In going through the components of the cell membrane in detail, we have already talked about the phospholipids as well as cholesterol. You remember the phospholipids form the bilayer with the hydrophobic parts facing away from the aqueous layer and the hydrophilic parts facing towards the aqueous layer. We also talked about cholesterol. This is a lipid component that provides rigidity to prevent uncontrolled movement of substances across the membrane. Another thing we need to know is about glycolipids. Like their name suggests, glyco means derived from a sugar and a lipid, of course, that means there is going to be a lipid. So a glycolipid is made up of a carbohydrate that is attached to a lipid, and it is for cell recognition of other body cells, meaning this is going to be used by one body cell to recognize another body cell. There are other membrane proteins that include the peripheral proteins as well as integral proteins. Peripheral means they are found on the surface membrane, and integral means they are inserted into the membrane. So peripheral proteins, these are membrane surface proteins that are attached to the membrane by interaction with other proteins. And integral, these are inserted into the membrane. They are part of the whole membrane. We also talk about glycoproteins. Like their name suggests, glyco means there is a carbohydrate and, of course, attached to a protein. They are embedded into the membrane to help in cell-cell communication and transport across the membrane. We have carrier proteins. Carrier proteins are integral proteins that transport substances across the membrane down and against the concentration gradient. This means they can use both active and passive transport. Then the channel proteins, these are proteins that facilitate transport across the membrane down a concentration gradient, and that means these carry out only passive transport. There is no need of ATP for transport across the channel proteins. So these are the components we've been talking about. You can see the glycoprotein, this is a protein attached to a carbohydrate. We have the glycolipid. Of course, this is going to be a lipid and a carbohydrate. We have the channel proteins. You can see they go along the whole membrane, transporting substances from one side to the other. And these do not need ATP. There is cholesterol that allows for rigidity to be attained. And then we can see some globular proteins that are within the membrane, peripheral proteins, which are surface proteins, and so on. So you need to understand the components as well as the functions of some molecules found within the cell membrane. Mainly, you need to know the function of cholesterol. You need to know the function of some channel proteins, glycolipids, and so on. Now, in reference to core practical three, this is about investigating properties of the cell membrane by measuring its permeability to particular molecules like betalain. This comes from beetroots. As cell membrane conditions like temperature vary, or in the presence of varying alcohol concentration. Here we need to know that the amount of red color, which is the red betalain color produced, can be determined using vision, meaning your eyes, or a colorimeter. This question could come in unit one or in unit three. You need to know that alcohols dissolve lipids, so an increase in the concentration of the alcohol is gonna lead to a greater leakage in the betalain, and therefore there is gonna be more color, more red color that leaks out. As you can see my graph here, the higher the alcohol concentration, the higher the membrane permeability. And then for temperature, the higher the temperature, the more the phospholipids become fluid, and this leads to greater leakage. You also need to know that as the temperature increases, the proteins are going to be denatured, and that would further increase the ability of these molecules to leak out. Moving on to topic 2A2, cell transport and diffusion. Here we're going to talk about transport across membranes. We'll be looking at passive as well as active transport mechanisms. Of course, the components within the membranes affect the movement of substances across. The size of the molecules, meaning bigger substances or smaller substances. Also, we need to know solubility in lipids. Because the bilayer is made up of phospholipid tails that are hydrophobic, so it means substances that go directly through the cell membrane should be able to dissolve 
in lipids if they cannot then it's going to be harder for them to be carried across the membrane directly through the phospholipids so the key thing is the size of the substances their solubility in lipid or in water absence or presence of charge these determine which method is going to be used to transport substances in or out of the cell we need to know that transport across the membrane can be active or it can be passive in passive transport substances are moved across the membrane and this takes place when there is a concentration gradient it could be a pressure gradient or an electrochemical gradient this method of transport does not involve the use of energy in the form of atp i want to be very specific in the form of atp because if you just say it involves no use of energy then somebody will think even kinetic energy is not involved this energy we're referring to is the one in form of atp then active transport this involves the movement of substances across the cell membrane using ATP, and this occurs against the concentration gradient. The ATP used is produced during cellular respiration. Passive transport methods include diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. In active transport, of course, there is normal active transport. There is endocytosis as well as exocytosis. So we're gonna look at all these methods one at a time. Like we said already, Passive transport mechanisms include diffusion. This is the movement of particles in a liquid or gas down a concentration gradient. They move from an area where they are relatively high in concentration to an area where they are relatively low in concentration, and this occurs by random movement. Facilitated diffusion is a form of diffusion that takes place through carrier proteins or at least protein channels. This also does not involve the use of ATP. Osmosis is a specialized form of diffusion that involves the movement of solvent molecules. In this case, we're going to be talking about water molecules down a water potential gradient through a partially permeable membrane. The active transport mechanisms include, like I already said, active transport, endocytosis, as well as exocytosis. These two being bulk transport mechanisms, they transfer things in bulk. So active transport always involves a carrier protein. Remember we said carrier proteins can use both active and passive, but channel proteins only use passive transport. So this always involves the use of a carrier protein, which carries molecules or ions through the membrane using energy supplied by the breakdown of ATP. There are also other two mechanisms for moving substances in or out of cells. These also use ATP. They include endocytosis as well as exocytosis. Endocytosis is the movement of large molecules into cells through vesicle formation. And exocytosis is the movement of large molecules out of cells through fusion of vesicles to the membrane. We're going to begin with the first one, which is diffusion. Like we already said, molecules move down a concentration gradient. And the motion happens randomly due to kinetic energy the molecules may possess. In this case, if molecules begin by being tightly packed together, we can see randomness is going to occur and we see they spread out until in the end when the concentration on the outside and the concentration on the inside is going to be exactly the same. Initially you see there is none here but as the fusion continues we can see some molecules are moving towards the cytoplasm and in the end they're going to be in equal concentration but even when the uniform distribution is reached the molecules do not stop moving. They continue to move but movement no longer causes a net change in concentration because the numbers are equal in all directions. This is expressed here as well as here. You can see they begin of being highly concentrated here, but they spread out through diffusion. And in the end, we have even concentration or even distribution of the molecules throughout the whole sample. When we move to facilitated diffusion, here strongly charged substances are large molecules that can cross the cell membrane by simple diffusion. So they may move into or out of the cell down a concentration gradient by this method of facilitated diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, proteins in the membranes will allow specific substances to move through passively, and this occurs down a concentration gradient. If they are lower inside, then they're gonna move into the cell, and if their concentration is lower on the outside, they're gonna leave the cell to go to the other side. Facilitated diffusion may be carried out through channel proteins that form pores through the membrane. And each type of channel protein allows one particular type of molecule to pass through. And this depends on the molecule's shape, or it could depend on the charge for these channel proteins to allow substances to go through. Also, some of these channels are going to be gated, 
meaning they open if a specific molecule is present or if there is an electrical charge across the membrane, such as during the passage of a nerve impulse in the neurons. So if this occurs, then these channels can open to allow specific ions or molecules to move across. Another type of facilitated diffusion can depend on carrier proteins. I already talked about this. We have the channel proteins, we have the carrier proteins. For carrier proteins, they carry out both active as well as passive. But in this case, since we're talking about facilitated diffusion, we're going to focus on passive transport. This is going to depend on the molecules or carrier molecules that are present on the surface of the membrane. The carrier proteins are found on the outside surface of the membrane when a substance is to be moved from the outside of the cell or organelle to the inside. And it's going to be found on the inside if the molecule is supposed to be transported from the cell or organelle to the outside. This movement through the membrane takes place because it changes shape once it is carrying something to the other side across the membrane. An example is what we see here. So here we can see a channel protein and there are specific molecules here. These are going through to the other side down a concentration gradient. This is the inside of the cell. Then we see these carrier proteins. You can see they change shape to allow specific substances to come into the cell or to move them outside of the cell. Moving on to topic 2A3, osmosis, a special case of diffusion. And again, here we are still looking at the methods of transport across the membrane. So osmosis, of course, this is the net movement of free water molecules through a partially permeable membrane down a water potential gradient. When they say down a water potential gradient, they mean from a region of high water potential to a region of low water potential. And here the water potential we're referring to is that of a solution, which measures the concentration of free water molecules within that specific solution. The osmotic concentration of a solution concerns only with solids that have osmotic effect. So this means we are referring to the ions or solids that can cause osmotic effect or that cause water molecules to move from one direction to the other. So these ions have to be only those that can be soluble. This can include soluble big plasma proteins such as albumin as well as fibrinogen. Osmotic concentrations include the following. We have isotonic, we have hypotonic as well as hypertonic. This is referring to specific solutions. If a solution is isotonic, it means the osmotic concentration of the solid is the same on both sides of the membrane, meaning inside and outside the membrane. When they say hypotonic, this means one side is going to be in lower concentration so in this case, we can say the concentration of solids in the solution is lower than that in the cytoplasm. Then hypertonic, where the concentration of solids in the solution is higher than that in the cytoplasm. In the first experiment, we have a beaker of pure water, and then we have a sucrose solution inside here. Initially, we can see inside this tubing, the volume is lower, but at the end, it has increased. Pure water has entered into the membrane bag, that contain the sucrose solution, causing the volume within the tubing bag to increase. So net movement of water into the bag as a result of osmosis has occurred. And on the other side, we see pure water is inside the bag and then sucrose solution is on the outside. That means we have a higher water potential inside the bag than on the outside. So water is going to move from the bag into the beaker by osmosis, causing a decrease in the volume of the tubing. To demonstrate osmosis in animal cells, we use red blood cells in this experiment. So in animal cells, if water continuously moves into the cell from a dilute external solution, the cell will swell and it could burst, as we can see in this situation, meaning in hypotonic conditions, water is going to continuously move into the cell, causing the swelling and potentially the cell could burst. In hypotonic solution, meaning the surrounding solution has a higher salt concentration, it means water is going to leave the cell, in this case the red blood cell, into the outside solution, causing the red blood cells to be shriveled, as you can see here. And in isotonic solution, of course, this is going to be a normal cell because the concentration on the outside is similar to the concentration inside the cell, so there will not be any drastic change. Moving on to osmosis in plants, Plant cells have cellular cell walls and this prevents the cells from bursting. In a hypotonic solution, water will enter the cytoplasm causing it to swell. The swollen cytoplasm will push onto the cell wall, generating hydrostatic pressure. 
so it's going to be pushing onto the cell wall but the cell wall is going to be tough meaning it cannot expand or give way further so the cell cannot bust so the produced hydrostatic pressure due to the pushing of the cytoplasm onto the cell wall is going to overcome the force that is causing the water to come into the cell meaning the inward pressure which is what we call the pressure potential when the osmotic force moving water into the cell is equal to the pressure generated forcing it out the plant cell is in a state of turgidity. Tugger provides support in stems as well as in leaves. In a slightly hypertonic solution, the plant cell is going to lose water by osmosis and the protoplasm is going to shrink. We call this incipient plasmolysis. Incipient because the solution was not that hypertonic, it was just slightly hypertonic. But in a hypertonic solution, this is a solution that is more concentrated than the previous one, Water is going to leave the cell and the vacuole will be reduced and the protoplasm is going to shrink all the way from the cell wall completely and this is going to cause a process we call plasmolysis or the cells will suffer plasmolysis. However, because of the cell wall, the size and shape of the plant cells does not change much whether they are fully turgid or fully plasmolized. This is my demonstration to show how osmosis occurs in plant cells. In isotonic solution, the cell is going to have a normal shape or normal size. When we go to hypotonic solution, this is where the concentration is lower, so it means water is going to enter into the cell, causing it to swell. The cytoplasm is going to push onto the cell wall, and we can see the cell is in a state of turgidity. In hypertonic solutions, meaning the concentration on the outside is higher than the concentration on the inside, here the cell is going to lose water to the surrounding, the cytoplasm is going to pull away from the cell wall and we can see it's going to be in a shrunken state. The size of the cell is not going to be affected that much, but the cytoplasm is going to shrink. Moving on to topic 2A4, which is active transport. Like we already said, active transport involves a carrier protein, which often spans the whole membrane from the outside to the inside of the membrane. In this case, the proteins may be very specific. If they're specific, they can pick up only one type of ion or molecule, or the protein may work for several relatively similar substances that compete with each other for the place in the carrier protein. Energy used in this active process is provided by the molecule ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. The active transport carrier system in the membrane involves the enzyme ATPase, and this is the one that catalyzes the hydrolysis of ATP by the breakdown of one bond in order to produce ADP and an inorganic phosphate. Active transport is a one-way system for each specific substance. And active transport systems move substances only in one direction required by the cell, meaning it does not move the same substance in and out of the cell. In active transport, the movement of a substance is often linked with that of another particle, such as sodium ion. In your second year, you will study the details of this movement of ions across specific membranes. And actually, the sodium-potassium pump is the best known active transport system that you will meet later on in your study. This pump actively moves potassium ions into the cell and sodium ions out of the cell. To demonstrate active transport, here we have a cell membrane. Imagine this is the cell membrane, which is the bilayer. And this is the molecule that is involved in active transport. We can see on the outside we have a lower concentration of these specific substances and on the inside they are higher in concentration. However, we have to move the same substances from a region where they are lower in concentration to a region where they are high in concentration. This can only be attained through active transport using a molecule of ATP, breaking it down using this enzyme which is ATPase to provide ADP as well as PI and energy is going to be released in the process that is going to facilitate this movement of substances. Going through other active transport mechanisms, these include bulk transport mechanisms, which are endocytosis and exocytosis. In endocytosis, this is the process by which cells take in larger particles, and this occurs on a relatively large scale, for example, in the ingestion of bacteria during phagocytosis. It also happens on the microscopic level when tiny amounts of surrounding fluids are taken into minute vacuoles or tiny vacuoles. This is a process called pinocytosis or you could say cell drinking process. 
In looking at exocytosis, this is emptying of a membrane-bound vesicle at the surface of the cell or somewhere else. For example, in cells that produce hormones, the vesicles will contain the hormone. Of course, they're going to fuse with the cell surface membrane and they will release this hormone outside of the cell. The process requiring the formation of these vesicles, as well as the fusion of these vesicles with the cell surface membrane, are both active processes and these require energy supplied by using ATP. Moving on to bowel transport mechanisms, here we're going to be looking at the details of exocytosis and endocytosis. You can see here a vesicle forms inside the cell and it's carrying some components. It could be proteins or something else. Then it delivers them to the membrane. The vesicle fuses with the cell membrane and then these components that are contained inside the vesicle are released to the outside. This is exocytosis. And then on the other side, we can see components are coming in and a vesicle is going to be formed using components of the cell membrane. As we can see here, part of the cell membrane forms a vesicle surrounding the components that are to be taken into the cell. And then this is going to be delivered into the cytoplasm. You can see this is the vesicle carrying the components or enclosing the components inside. So this process here is endocytosis. So the key thing is exocytosis delivers things outside the cell and endocytosis delivers things into the cell. In both situations, vesicles are formed. In topic 2A5, the need for gas exchange surfaces. Here we're going to talk about the need for these surfaces in small as well as large organisms. The small organisms include single-celled organisms as well as very tiny multicellular organisms. These have a large surface area to volume ratio meaning they can get the oxygen needed as well as the substances into the cell within a shorter period of time. So they do not require distribution mechanisms as we see in larger organisms. Now in larger organisms, as the organisms get bigger, the surface area to volume ratio gets smaller and they begin to need specialized surfaces and systems to get oxygen they require. So the complex organisms have evolved specialized systems. This is like the gaseous exchange system in order to take in oxygen and remove carbon dioxide more efficiently to sustain life or in order to have enough oxygen within the required period of time for aerobic respiration to produce ATP that is required for cellular activity. So in humans and many other large animals, gas exchange takes place in the lungs. In the fish, it takes place in the gills. This is supposed to be gills. And then in insects, it takes place through the tracheal system and in plants, most gas exchange takes place in the leaves. Properties of gaseous exchange systems. Gas exchange systems are specialized for exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the body of the organism as well as the environment. So most of this exchange occurs by simple diffusion. Factors to consider include surface area, the thickness of the gas exchange surfaces, as well as having a good concentration gradient. These are all explained using Fick's law of diffusion. The rate of diffusion is equal to the surface area times the concentration difference divided by the thickness of exchange membranes or barriers. So the key thing is, if we have a large surface area, let me use arrows, if we have a large surface area and a large concentration gradient, and then we have a smaller thickness of the exchange surface membrane, it means we're going to have a higher rate of diffusion. This is using mathematics basic principle, you want something big here, make the numerator big and the denominator small, then you're going to get a big value as a result. So for effective gaseous exchange, the surface area has to be larger, the concentration gradient has to be greater, and then the thickness of the exchange membranes has to be as small as possible. Any factor which makes the top larger, such as a big surface area or a high concentration gradient, or makes the bottom number small, such as a thin exchange membrane, will increase the rate of diffusion. In topic 2S6, the mammalian gas exchange system. So again, features of effective gas exchange systems. We're going to talk about the same things we've talked about before. A large surface area, this gives sufficient gas exchange to supply all the needs of the organism. And then having thin layers minimizes the diffusion distances from one side to the other meaning diffusion is going to occur faster. In animals, 
a rich blood supply is going to be important because this ensures that as soon as oxygen diffuses inside, it's going to be carried away immediately. And this is going to maintain a steep concentration gradient, which is sufficient for a faster rate of diffusion. Also, moist surfaces are important because these gases are going to be dissolved in solution in order for them to be transported. Also, permeable surfaces that allow free passage of respiratory gases is going to be required. So here we have a typical structure of the human gas exchange system. You are not required to memorize everything, but at least you need to know that this is called a trachea. You need to know that we have two lungs. You need to know about the bronchioles, about the left bronchus and the right bronchus, of course. We need to know their ribs, external and internal intercostal muscles, which are very important in inhalation as well as exhalation. We need to know there is a diaphragm, which is fibrous and has capability to contract or relax. So components of the breathing system and their functions, the nozzle cavity, this is the main route by which air enters the gas exchange system. You need to know that. Of course, the mouth air can enter through the mouth into the respiratory system. The mouth ensures that the air is going to be warmed and it's going to be moistened. The epiglottis is there to prevent food from entering the gas exchange system. Then the larynx, which is the voice box, this uses the flow of air across it to produce sound. The trachea is lined with mucus secreting cells, which are called the goblet cells, and cilia on the surfaces that move the mucus and any trapped microorganisms and dust away from the lungs. The rings of cartilage prevent the trachea and the bronchi from collapsing onto each other. Then the bronchi, these are tubes that lead to the lungs with cartilage to keep them open. The bronchioles are small tubes that spread through the lungs and end in the alveoli. The purpose of the alveoli are to be the gas exchange surfaces in the lungs. The ribs are there to act as a protective bony cage around the gas exchange system in case somebody experiences trauma. Intercostal muscles, these are formed between the ribs and are important in breathing, which moves air in and out of the lungs to maintain a steep concentration gradient for rapid gas exchange. The pleural membranes surround the lungs and line the chest cavity, forming a sterile sealed unit. And the pleural cavity is a space between the pleural membranes and is usually filled with a thin layer of lubricating fluid that allows the membranes to slide easily with breathing movements. The diaphragm is a sheet of tissue made of tendons and muscle and forms the floor of the chest cavity. It's also important in breathing movements. The next part is going to focus on the alveoli. Alveoli is plural, alveolus is singular. So the alveolus is made of a single layer of flattened epithelial cells. Capillaries run close to the alveoli, and these are also one cell thick. Between the alveoli and the capillaries is a layer of elastic connective tissue that holds everything together. This elastic tissue helps to force air out of the lungs, which are stretched when you breathe in, and this is known as elastic recoil of the lungs. The alveoli have a natural tendency to collapse, but it's prevented by a special phospholipid known as the lung surfactant. This is going to cord inside the alveoli and it will make breathing easier. Gaseous exchange occurs by a process of simple diffusion between the alveolar air and the deoxygenated blood in the capillaries. So here, this is an example of how gaseous exchange occurs. We see we have the alveolus here, and then we have the capillary moving around. This layer of the alveolus and this layer of the capillary are both one cell thick meaning the diffusion distance is quite short, so oxygen can easily move into the capillary from the alveolus and CO2 can easily move to the other side through the process of diffusion. And then we see many alveolus are going to be formed within the lungs and they are surrounded by many blood capillaries. So as soon as oxygen diffuses into the blood capillary, it's going to be carried away and that is going to maintain a steep concentration gradient in order for oxygen to continuously come in. Since carbon dioxide is going to be moved out, a steeper concentration gradient for the removal of CO2 is also going to be maintained. This is extracted from your textbook, and this is something I drew. Here you can see the squamous epithelial cells of the alveolars, and you can see one cell thick on both sides. This is one cell, and that is one cell, so the diffusion distance is quite short, and that is going to ensure a faster rate of diffusion. This is a table from your textbook that talks about the specific compositions of gases, they can give you a similar table in the exam and ask you to explain the changes in the compositions, for example, of oxygen, 
Why is it higher in inspired air, but in expired air, it's lower? That is because the oxygen in inspired air is going to be used in solar respiration. So the concentration that comes out is going to be lower. Also, the carbon dioxide concentration increases from this one here to that. That is because CO2 is produced within the cells through aerobic respiration. So the concentration increases. Why is it that the concentration of nitrogen does not significantly change? If you compare the inhaled and exhaled, there is not much difference. You say that is because nitrogen is not necessarily used up or produced in the cell. And again, the concentrations I used in this table are those extracted from your textbook. Usually we can say, oh, in the exam, they could give you this is 78 and that is 78. So if there is no difference between the two, then your answer can be suitably written as since no cellular process uses up nitrogen or nitrogen is not used up or produced, the concentration remains the same. We also see water vapor increases. That is because as a product of respiration, water is produced. So this water can come out through the process of breathing out. This figure here is explaining the purpose of the lung surfactant that prevents the layers of the alveolus from collapsing onto each other. Also, we can see there's some macrophages within the alveolars. The purpose of this is to carry out phagocytosis in order for these pathogens not to enter the blood. So they're going to be engulfed and destroyed so that they do not diffuse through the squamous cells to the blood capillary and to be taken to other parts of the body. So this is showing us inhalation, exhalation, conditions inside the alveolars, phagocytosis occurring inside the alveolars, and then the purpose of lung surfactant in the process of gaseous exchange. Next, we're going to explain about ventilation. Moving air between the lungs and the external environment is an active process known as breathing in or what we call ventilation. So breathing maintains a steep concentration gradient for diffusion between the blood in the capillaries and the air in the lungs. We need to know there are two parts of the process of breathing. One is inhalation when you breathe in and the other is exhalation when you breathe out. In inhalation, this is an active process and it requires energy. During inhalation, the diaphragm is going to contract and it will flatten. Then the intercostal muscles, usually external intercostal muscles, are going to contract. This causes the chest cavity to move upwards as well as outwards. And this movement causes an increase in the thoracic cavity volume. That will lead to a decrease in the pressure of the thoracic cavity below atmospheric pressure. And when this occurs, air is going to be drawn into the lungs from the outside. Now, during normal exhalation, this is going to be a passive process. So during exhalation, the diaphragm is going to relax and it becomes dome-shaped. Then the intercostal muscles are going to relax. Again, here referring to the external intercostal muscles, they relax and the chest cavity is going to move inwards and downwards. Then this is going to lead to a decrease in the thoracic cavity volume, leading to an increase in the thoracic cavity pressure above atmospheric pressure. And this is going to force air out of the lungs. Coughing is an exaggerated form of forced exhalation, which is used to force mucus out of the respiratory system. So whatever I drew here is to show you the details of these mechanisms of inhalation as well as exhalation. For inhalation, like I already said, the external intercostal muscles are going to contract. The rib cage is going to be pulled up and out. And the diaphragm is also going to contract and it's going to flatten. Then this space here is going to increase in volume. The pressure is going to decrease below atmospheric pressure. And then this is going to come in. Then for exhalation, the intercostal muscles or external intercostal muscles are going to relax. The rib cage is going to be pulled down and in. And then the diaphragm is going to relax and become dome shaped. And when this occurs, the volume inside is going to decrease, causing an increase in the pressure. And when this increases above atmospheric pressure, air is going to be forced out. The air you breathe in also carries a lot of foreign bodies, like this is similar to what I talked about pathogens. These foreign bodies could block the tiny alveoli and cause respiratory infections. So mucus produced by the cells lining the airways will trap these pathogens and any particles that are in inhaled air. Because mucus is going to be runny as it traps these substances, the cilia will then sweep the runny mucus and trap particles upwards towards the throat. The cilia in the trachea and bronchi beat constantly to move mucus with its load of pathogens 
and dirt out of your gas exchange system, and this is going to protect your lungs from infection. So this brings us to the end of topic 2A of AS Biology. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.